the waiting room is in, and I'll keep an eye out for for more as they um <coughs> try to go in. I um seem to have misplaced my script for the um COVID um, authorization to conduct a, a meeting, but I think I've said it enough times that I kind of remember um, what the deal is that the governor has um, imposed a state of emergency allowing the open meeting law to be circumvented by using, in this case, the Zoom platform. And you can find the um, access to that uh, meeting connections either on the town websites and the posted agendas throughout the town or by requesting a specific email to um, to get the connection information. Let me let somebody else in here. And, and here we go. So at this point, um, do we have any additions to the um, publicized agenda for the meeting tonight? Um, Dune? Yeah. I didn't see it on the list, but I thought after talking with Patty this morning that we might uh, make a quick discussion about whether or not to do Fourth of July parade. Okay. Okay. Thank yep. you. Your old business coming forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yep. All right. Let me see. I think we got everyone in here. There was. I did get some an emailed request to to make sure that there were a couple issues on the agenda and those were um, um, the signage on Bethel Mountain Road and what role Two River Ottaquichi Regional Planning Commission plays, um, something about redistricting, which I'm not sure exactly what that is about, but um, let me admit some more folks here. And um, a question about um, the continued use of Zoom platform for these meetings. So I'll add those to the agenda. And I think we'll start then by um, looking at the minutes from the April 12th meeting. And did you guys see any corrections that you, uh, let me get this person in, any changes to those minutes? No, I only saw one typo that had no effect on the, on what the statement was. All right. Yeah, there was a couple other small things, but no effect either, Pat. I caught a couple of them. No big deal, though. All right. So I'd, I'd move to um, accept those minutes as presented. I second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All righty. So we've got those minutes. And we have, um, have a variety of guests in here tonight. Um, we've got... Um, Bunch of people I'm not sure that I know. We've got well Kirk White and did he make it into the, the gang here tonight? Not seeing him. Um, but we've got uh, Arthur Linz and Mark Shea. And um, you guys have something that you wanted to speak about? No. <laughs> okay, if they come back later, we should um, um do yeah. Yeah. Arthur Arthur Lines is here. It will be, well, he was going to um, come for the uh, Able Waste. Oh, okay. All right. So um, then we'll get that on our agenda there. Then we'll get to it when we get. And um, Zach, um, how do you pronounce your last name, Zach? Kavakis. 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 Yeah. Did you have something in particular that you wanted to chat about? Yeah, um, so my business partner and I, uh, Jake Flood, who's also on the call, um, we are in the process of opening a compost facility up on Jerusalem Hill. Um, we Part of the uh, requirement is to get a town, a letter from the town um, supporting it. And uh, so we wanted to bring it up on the select board meeting. People had questions. Um, he can answer, he can jump in, he can answer um, any technical questions you may have about the facility. But basically, we need to run it by you guys, the plan, and uh, get approval from you guys to be able to move forward with our state permit. Okay, the state um, permit, I just want to know that the town was aware of it. How, how big right. of an operation are you talking about? <clears throat> so it's, it's, con it's considered a small facility based on the the 
volume of food scraps are going to be handling. Um, it's less than 200 cubic yards of food scraps a year is, is what we're uh, banking on. Um, the the threshold for a small facility is 2,000, so we're obviously well below that. Um, is that what? What's that? 2,000 two what? Cubic yards. Cubic yards, okay. Of, of uh, food scraps. So that's the... That's the threshold for a small facility. Any anything under two thousand cubic yards a year of, of uh, processing of food scraps is considered a a small facility in the in the state's eyes. So, um, and excuse me, you said you expected it to be about two hundred cubic yards per year. Yeah, that's our okay. that's our like upper threshold at the moment. Um, Zach's adding some new accounts as he goes. Um, so. Yeah, so basically what I do is I go around, um, I work four days picking up compost from residentially, and, um, and I've been doing it since last July, and Jake got recently got his permit through the state to be able to open a uh, facility, uh, so we've done projections, and that's uh, the 200 yards is what we came up with per that. So, so what happens at the facility? Um, what what type of process? It's a processing facility. So basically, what what happens is Zach will you know four days a week he'll collect his food scraps um, and they get brought up to the facility um, and basically all the facility is um, will just be a you know a gravel pad with um, some concrete blocks around it to contain the material and the material will get mixed with. Um, Obviously, it's pretty wet, so it'll get mixed with some dry matter um, to contain the moisture and um, basically get mixed uh, twice a week with uh, drier material. Um, and the landowner up there is actually going to be doing the mixing. So he's our kind of the third part of this is, um, is Stuart. So who, who so, is your who entity? It's a profit entity. Sorry, what, what was that? Yeah. Your your business is a for profit business. Correct. Yep. Okay. Nancy Woolley, you had a question. I just wondered where on Jerusalem it's right. going to be. Uh, for Brown's the, property. Yeah, all the way at the end, essentially. Yeah, and we've uh, we've spoken with everybody that lives uh, of his neighbors. Or he has, um, and they're all um, okay with you know the facility we're putting in. So they all given us the okay. Um, as far as being neighborly, also going to be fenced in. Uh, the area we're going to do the mixing be fenced in, so animals won't be able to, especially like dogs, won't be able to get into it, eat grapes and stuff like that. How does this the state look at your business? Is is it a commercial or is it considered ag? Um, I'm not. I, I think it's it's considered a commercial business. Um, I guess, but it's it's mainly agricultural i mean uh, basically the, yeah. the, the distinct so if you're on a farm and you're composting farm waste and whatnot they're not they don't require you to have a permit but as far as like a, a facility that that processes food scraps you have to you have to be you have to go through the training which which is what i did um mm -hmm. earlier this year and then you also have to be registered it's a new thing they're doing the last couple of years is they're actually having facilities register um, everything that happened before was kind of grandfathered in. So basically every existing facility didn't have to go through this whole process, but, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to upgrade and, and be, you know, kind of more neighborly, I guess, um, as they, they kind of expand this program. So. Do you plan on having retail there? No. Um, selling to the public. Is that good? No, I mean, we're going to be delivering, um, you know, we'll be delivering it to, you know, people and we're going to try to get it into stores eventually, but we're not going to be setting up shop on this property uh, to do retail. That's not part of the agreement with Stuart. Yeah, he doesn't want a bunch of people up there running around. So, um, so you would be uh, bagging? Potentially. We got to figure out the process and, and how we're going to do that. I mean, most of it's going to be you know, bulk deliveries. Um, and when I say bulk, it's going to be, you know, in Zach's trailer, eight by five trailer. Yeah. So it's not, but we're also going to be, a, we're going to figure out the bagging part of it though. Yeah. It'll be bagged at some point. Just uh, at the, at the moment we're just, we're still figuring out the best way to do so, that. 
is all the compost coming from, I know, Zach, you have a business where you go around and yes. you pick up people's compost. Is that where it's, it's all, all coming, coming from? It's all coming from my business. That's that's okay. solely where all this is coming from. So and I'm, I'm permitted with, what's that? I was just saying, so, you know, um, people wouldn't, it, it sounds like people wouldn't be able to go up and drop off their, nope. their <clears throat> No, no, no. Um, okay. Stuart yeah. wouldn't want that. Um, but no, basically, not. like, as far on my end, as far as, like, transporting compost, um, I have a permit with the state. I have to renew it every year. Uh, my permit number is 2325. Um, and then I also have a permit for every district that I'm in that requires it. I'm in 64 towns. Um, so each district is different. Um, so I'm in, you know, we're in complete compliance and everything's coming just from the 64 towns that I operate in. So, um, Nancy, you had another question then? I just wondered if there was anything written that we could read about the whole process um yeah there's there's definitely um there's a bunch of literature online uh for the anr um i don't know exactly what the website is but if you i have a bunch of it um because i, I was in the program um but yeah if you look up um i'm trying to think i got I have a bunch of literature that i have um that i downloaded so i you know obviously i needed it for sure. Um, so I would um, think that um, the zoning of that area is is what really comes into play and in that I, I, without looking at a map, that's probably what uh, residential agricultural. So that's considered um, con, I think it's con conservation residential district. Residential. Yep, conservation residential. I, um, I would think they'd want to apply for a conditional use through the um, zoning planning and zoning board planning zoning that yeah that i would think sense. so they they would have to in order to cover their bases and seek a conditional use for what they're trying to do it's because it's it's kind of a borderline commercial ag i would say and i i'm not i don't have anything against it believe me but I, just so that you're covered i would think that that you go through and the process of getting a permit through the planning and zoning and that would probably probably um serve the purpose very well of getting a letter of, of support from the town if you actually went and got a, a you know a conditional use permit for that activity i would think that it's um i think it tends more on the agricultural side than as a as a business per se so i think that it's it's um um a good likelihood of, of being um an approved activity but that would be probably the way to go is to um, approach the um the planning planning board and that they meet the first tuesday of every month which is coming up in a week or so so um you know that would um i think that would be the uh the, the best way to go here did you have a specific um, um did the state require a specific um what they wanted from the town or I well so the state actually didn't require the only thing the state requires is that the you know uh, basically a, a a statement saying that the it, it's in the in, a, in the uh application process is asked if there's if anything in the town zoning um basically excludes compost facilities within the zoning itself um what basically what prompted this coming up is we have to get a letter letter of approval from the solid waste district so when i talked with them they said that they wouldn't sign off on anything until the town did so that's kind of why yeah i don't think this is normally part of the process but um you know we obviously want to do whatever we have to do to keep everybody happy so right. Right. i've got a question um um is oh, that you yeah uh just wondering if you have any kind of a site plan that was prepared uh for getting your permit from the state and if that's something the town could see uh, i'm just thinking there's you know there are a lot of streams out there headwater streams and yep. Yep. i think maybe the main concern outside of the zoning would be just making sure that there's no um you know nothing that flows into a, a, a stream or a wetland up there yeah that's part of the application process as well so it's kind of rudimentary at the moment because you know the the anr and atlas program is a little 
tough to use, but we yeah, do have a we do have a site plan. Um, and, and one of the big requirements was uh, mitigating the storm runoff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Zach and um, Jacob, am I correct that the name of your business is Vermont Black Gold Compost? That is correct. Yeah. Yep. Hey, great. Thank you. Yep. Pat, yeah. One. Um, Jake, what is your relationship? Do you own the land that you're going to be using? Is is Nope. Um, uh -huh. I'm Zach. Zach and I went to high school together, so we're really good friends. We've been friends for a really long time. So, okay. so where um, do you live? I live in South Burlington. I'm from Castleton originally. Okay. Um, yeah. there's a possibility that the owner of the land may be the one who needs to apply uh, to the 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 select board, the planning board. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, if you're leasing the land or what you're doing, but it may it may fall upon Stuart to. Uh, go ahead and start filing these documents. I would look into that if I were you. Okay. And I would I would think also that that uh, the planning commission would be the one to write the letter because that's really their jurisdiction, not so much the select board. Yeah, yeah, so I, I was think. I was curious. I was reading through the the zoning documents. Um, so, so does all that apply even if there's no permanent structures or permanent uh, changes happening to the land? It's it's a change of use for the property, and yeah. and it okay. encompasses it encompasses that a a change of use is is when you start doing something different on a on a place where and you're borderline commercial kind of thing, mm -hmm. and because the town does have zoning and has had zoning for years. I would just think that would be your way to go. I don't see any issue with it personally. Sure. Um, and I, I don't think the, the zoning board would have any issues with it either. I think if you just have to direct the plan and it would also aid in your getting all your rest of your stuff because you've gone through the planning and zoning process, I think it would help you in the long run for what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And let's just say if your business uh, triples and quadruples in size, um, you don't want to have to go backwards and apply for any permits later. You might as well get it all on the up and up now and, and hopefully the business grows. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. We just have to talk with Stuart about that. I don't know. I don't know what sort of bandwidth he has for figuring out uh, the the planning <laughs> paperwork and all that stuff. So but we can probably, we, we're not able to do that. Uh, well, it would, you it would have to come. I think you you guys could do it and just have Stuart sign it. Okay, you know, right. You know, I, I don't sure. see where that's a big deal. That's I mean, you submit the plan and the process is all laid out. Really, they'll they'll have to warn a conditional use hearing, and landowners can come and and anybody that's that might be uh, interested in what you're doing there, and offer a you know have anything they disagree with on it or or have concerns with they'll voice that and then the planning board and zoning will put conditions on your use like maybe hours of day you can use it you know just stuff like that it's it's really just a process that helps everybody and kind of keeps it going so shouldn't yeah. be a big deal for you i wouldn't think sure all right yeah we'll get it done yeah is there any sort of paper, paperwork or anything you can you can point us to for that or like this, um, that like, would go on to the town website and just fill out uh, or go to the town office then that would be the um is that the zoning application that has a change of use as the option or, or a conditional use permit i guess just um the um the zoning application if you want to do a, a change of use and that's you know we can kind of figure it out as you go at the at the meeting okay okay yeah, I mean, we want to do whatever it takes to make you guys happy with it. And uh, if it's able to go forward, then great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for, um, Thank you. Letting us know instead of just the, that sweet smell rolling down the valley. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Um, Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, Diane Carlton, you're listed here as a guest. Did you have something on your mind? I do. Um, we, uh, this is John Alexander as well. We um, purchased property up on West Hill and originally the bridge was going to be done, I guess maybe this late summer. 
but it's been pushed off and we're wanting to build up there. Uh, and so what we're hoping is to get some information on um, who do we follow up with to find out like when it might be um, built and um, you know, is there somebody we should be in touch with that we can kind of follow up on that? Well, we're, we're working in conjunction. It's really the Forest Service that is um, driving this, this bridge project. And um, as Frank, do you have an update on where we stand with that? I, I don't. Uh, Joan could probably address this issue better than I could. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's um, nothing new since uh, last time we talked about it, which is that uh, I think primarily for funding reasons at the federal level, but also possibly due to, to COVID delays as well, um, Forest Service decided to put off the project until next year. You know, originally our plan was to go into construction sometime this year. The, the plan uh, preparation has also taken a lot longer than we expected. It was supposed to be done uh, two, three months ago, and it's still in the completion stages now. So um, we will not be, well, we still have to know also that we have funding from the Forest Service. They haven't uh, been able to pull that together yet. And so that's that's totally on them to do because the, you know the, the town does not have funding to do the bridge. Um, the only reason we're able to do it uh, is because of the Forest Service funding. Um, so we expect them to come through by sometime next year, which would mean spring, summer of, of uh, 2022 is when they would do the replacement. Um. And is there like a, a, like if it gets moved out again, shall I say, I mean, is there, um, will it be at this meeting that it gets like announced as far as, yes, it's moving forward or, you know, how can we um, there will follow the process? Definitely be updates on, on the, the progress on there. And I would, um, I wouldn't be too worried about it getting continually bumped forward because they they do need to do this bridge for the planned um, tim timber harvesting that's going up there. And that is, um, you know, they're not under the gun to get this done, but it's, it's um, you know, it's, um, it's much more real than it would have been two years ago, that's for sure. <clears throat> okay. And so at right now, you're anticipating it's going to be built um in spring of 22 is that what you said joan spring well, oh sorry yeah, spring, spring or summer um okay class as close as we can come to a a date at this point all right and is it my you have a, an address or anything um email or something we could you know keep you updated if we hear any news i mean that would probably be the way to go wouldn't you think joan yeah sure um, so if you would send your email address or whatever to the town we will keep you updated on changes or anything else that comes up yeah yeah we, i appreciate that yeah we pre appreciate you coming and building a house yeah <laughs> and is it my understanding your patience <laughs> <laughs> is it my understanding that they're going to put in a temporary bridge during the construction process? And if so, do we have any idea what the weight capacity is of that temporary bridge? Yeah, there will be a temporary bridge. I don't know the weight capacity. I imagine it would be probably more than what's there now. Yeah. Um, I don't know the, what the specs are at this point. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Bye. Um, Joan, you've um, um, been mm -hmm. helpful answering some of these questions. Do you, um, you want to continue on with your updates? Um, sure. I don't have a lot to update you on because it's the same stuff I've been doing for the past number of months. Um, I worked with CUDA over the past several weeks and put together the bid notice and the bid documents for completing uh, the last of the FEMA funded road projects um, that have to be done by the end of this calendar year. So that bid was, the bid notice was in um, the Herald last week and it was posted on the state bidding site as well. 
So, and uh, I think I sent you an email already letting you know that uh, we'd be opening the bids on, uh, what did I say, May, Monday, May 10th, and making decision, you know, within a couple days after that. It's, and uh, the projects consist of uh, five, five different roads, with some of them with more than one uh, ditching site, the stone line ditching. Um, some of them are on the small side and some of them are fairly large. Um, so in the other FEMA project that uh, we have to complete this year is the retaining wall uh, for the stormwater outlet um, on, the, on the town property. And I've been working with Frank on that to uh, get the landowner permission from the abutter. It's that uh, Peter O'Connor and I forget his wife's name. It, it's Terry O'Connor and, Ter and Peter Jensen. <laughs> Peter Jensen, okay, yeah. Between you and me, getting those names confused. So my apologies. Anyway. Uh, Joan, Joan, did you say that the stormwater, was the stormwater outlet was on, on town property? Uh, the outlet itself is on town property. Okay, thank you. Retaining wall, which is caving in, and uh, it extends onto the O'Connor property. Um, so we had to make sure that we were going to be able to, to do the work there without, you know, and have their consent. Um, okay, so Frank was able to get that on Friday. We'll do uh, a temporary easement and see if we can get a permanent easement as well. So then in the future the town will be able to, you know, go on to the property and do any further repairs that might be needed 50 years on or something like that. So Cricket is finalizing drawings for that. She's gonna to put together the bid documents because they're a bit technical. And so probably by mid, middle of next month, that bid will be out. The bid notice will be out for that as well. We, um, we probably have right away there because the sewer line is there, but we just couldn't find it. Yeah, and well, so, we did find easements for the sewer line, but not for the retaining wall. So yeah. it was a little, you know, that stuff was all back in the 70s at the, at the most recent. So, right. Um, and so otherwise, uh, I think I mentioned at the last meeting that there were still review, uh, FEMA review process going on with the work that was completed way back at the end of, by the end of 2019. Um, and I think we're almost at the end of this process, but I have said that before <laughs> yeah. and then I was wrong. So anyway, they, the latest set of questions had to do with whether we had received or gotten permits and whether we needed permits for any of the work that was done during that period. Um, and uh, Chris Bump from VTrans has been very helpful in hooking us up with the right people at the state and federal level to make sure that uh, there were no uh, permits needed that we had missed. So, so far we have a sign off from the state's stream engineer, Jaron Borg, and from the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, both of those parties saying that we did not need any permits. And the last one will be uh, Tuesday, that's the 28th. Cooter will be going out to all the, uh, there were four sites they were questioning. So Cooter will be going out with the woman who does uh, the wetlands work for the state. And hopefully she'll come to the same conclusion that there were no permits needed. And once we have that, uh, I think we'll be good to go to complete that, or at least wrap, wrap up that part of the UFEMA work. So that's all I have. All right, thank you. Um, Tony, what's, um, what's up with the library nowadays? Well, nothing very different yet. We're waiting for magical things to happen, of course, with the COVID business and so on. Our next uh, trustees meeting will be the 11th, I believe, at six o'clock. Okay. Um, is, um, did Terry Severy make it in? I see that he wants to um, talk some about the utility rates. But um, he, yeah, I'm here. Oh, you are? Okay, I didn't see you there. Yeah, what's, um, what are you thinking? Well, I, I, we haven't put much money to the side for raising. I talked to Frank a little bit about it. I've talked to a couple others, and I'm going to get some more. Frank and I thought today, may I get some more? I'm thinking if we could raise it, you know, just a little bit, even like a 10 cents per thousand is what I was thinking. And that doesn't raise anybody's rate enough to kill them. 
uh, you know, you're taking that, even say 10,000 gallons, that's only going to raise it $10 a quarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that way it puts it on the users. I mean, most towns have uh, fees for residential and fees for commercial. And we do not. And at the time we were setting all this up, we felt that the businesses get hit for quite a few other things all the time. So we decided that everybody would pay the same and it's based on usage anyway so if the business right. uses more water they're going to pay more anyway right and our biggest problem right now is which everybody puts in the low flush toilets so we aren't using so much water and so it's kind of can't leave them back at us if we don't have the money <laughs> uh, um, terry a question that, is but in the, even in the manholes i'm having a lot of problem with solids build up because we don't have we have probably six or eight manholes we have to flush at least twice a year um terry question um you said 10 cents per ten thousand gallons no you, I, I thought you gallons. yeah per ten thousand gallons no, and did you, no. Yeah. per thousand gallons for one thousand gallons pardon me thank yeah. you and also was that for businesses or for businesses and residential for both. everybody both okay thank you so 10 cents per 1,000 gallons. Okay, thank you. But I'm glad I asked. <laughs> talk a little bit. I'm going to get some more information. Some, We're probably one of the cheapest towns in the state right now for fees. But so I will get a bunch of other numbers from other towns and report back at the next meeting on this. What, what are we paying for 1,000 gallons currently? You're paying for water. You're paying uh, 40 cents or uh, 30 cents. Mm -hmm. per gallon and then the sewer department you're paying 65 cents so this wouldn't be um affecting the sewer rate also would it yes it would it would we so need to we we have in our fund we don't have a great amount of money i think there's like seventeen thousand in one and maybe 18 in the other there, somewhere's in there i can get accurate ones for the next meeting uh, but you take the sewer pump that we're going to do the walk around on Friday. Uh, they've been in there since 84. And I know last year they were talking that they're getting pretty weak. And just one of those pumps is 20 grand. I do have a spare one sitting downstairs right now, but <clears throat> that only is one. And that's just what the cost of the pump. We still got to get it all tied in. Uh, water pumps run around. 10 to 12 grand and I'd be willing to bet within the next year or two, I, the other one's going to go because they last about 10 to 11 years. And, uh, you know, the, the money's just not going to be there. I mean, this year if you look at, we got, you know, say 17,000 or so in the water, 4,000 that's going to go for cleaning the reservoir. So that's going to knock that down quite a little bit. The reservoir we have to get done every five years, mandatory. And it runs around four grand. All so, right. So you're gonna um, you're gonna gather some more information and give a final recommendation next meeting. Yes, I will. All right. I'll do my homework better. How's that? Right. Well, this is a good start. Yeah. But I just wanted everybody to be aware of it instead of dropping a bomb. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, if you um, need any help, Terry, Jeff, I'll give you a hand. Okay. Jeff, you had a question? Yeah. Um, Terry, uh, you mentioned a walk through uh, on Friday. Um, I've got on my calendar a meeting at the town clerk's office at 10 tomorrow. Yes, I do with you. For Friday walk through? Is, okay. Yeah. We have our is spring it, walk around for the sewer every year, and Friday's. I'm pretty sure you don't want to go on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll see you tomorrow then. I've got, I've got the forms yeah. from Efficiency Vermont that they will tell us what, what they recommend and what they can incentivize. Well, that'd be great. So that will segue right into um, what you have for us tonight, Jeff, as the energy coordinator. Um, not a whole lot. We are working on getting the... Um, uh, the GMP site visit uh, scheduled, um, rescheduled. 
um, so that Frank can be in on that. And uh, I will be meeting with planning and zoning. Um, and we've got Dan McKinley also invited to the GMP um, site tour. So we can integrate that. Um, by the end of this week, we should know um, how we did with the uh, Vermont Council of Rural Developments, uh, they call it Climate Economy Model Communities Program. Um, and pretty much I've gotten the, uh, I, there's no reason why we couldn't give the performance contractors the, the data that we have um, it would not violate any, um, any state statutes. Uh, it, it does if you're a school, but not if you're a municipality. Um, and working uh, on getting uh, the uh, uh, Mo Electric uh, campaign demo day scheduled uh, sometime the last week of May or first week of June. Um, what was the name of what electric? Mo Electric. Mo Electric. B O W? Yep. M-O-W. Oh, M-O-W, Mo Electric, I'm sorry. Not like Mo Electric, like I'm turning Mo lights on. <laughs> <laughs> I keep so, dropping the, the W, it doesn't yeah, look right. Yeah. You know? So Mo Electric, um, demo But I have campaign. checked with, I, I have checked with the, uh, the state, um, told them what we were planning and they identified what part of the COVID safety we need to meet and it shouldn't be a problem. Um, really shouldn't be much different than a farmer's market kind of thing. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, got um, ability rates. So um, probably one of the more critical things timely that we have to do tonight is um, adopt our local emergency management plan. Um, that's due by the first. And um, Vic, do you have anything you want to speak about on that? It's it's pretty um, kind of boilerplate, but important boilerplate. Yeah, just uh, the each town is required to have an emergency management plan, and each year it's required to be updated, reviewed, and adopted by the select board by uh, the first of May, and it'll be sent into uh, Two Rivers as as been working on this uh, each of the past five or six years or so. Uh, the update this year is pretty minimal, a uh, little bit of clarity on some of the roles, uh, some updates to some uh, phone numbers and email addresses. Um, and that's pretty much it in terms of uh, edits. One thing that we'll have to do uh, after the first of the year is uh, when uh, Lindy Stetson becomes principal for uh, both school campuses up to put in her information as the contact person for the emergency shelter, which is the elementary school. It's right now it's Bonnie. I noted one other thing there, Vic, too, that uh, the town manager of Bethel is, is Therese Kirby, not, um, I think you got uh, somebody else. Name there. Okay, thanks for correct that. I, I didn't notice it before, but I did notice it today. Okay, thank you. So is this something the board is voting on tonight to adopt this? Yeah, I'm about to move to adopt that plan with the correction that Frank just noted. I can second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, Arthur, are you still here to talk about the Able Waste proposal to um, not only increase the frequency of um, your service, but expand it to the neighboring towns? Yes, um, I don't think I'm on Zoom and I apologize for that, but can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, so so as you know, um, right now your guys' program is first and third. You run uh, eight o'clock in the morning to 11. Um, my proposal is what I would like to do is and i have to have your blessing because you're going to be considered the host town we do a program in granville and a program in hancock on the second and fourth you guys are the first and third so nobody gets done on the bye week um uh the fifth of of what four months so what and and some of some of each town is going to each other's other towns anyways. 
and you you all pay. Granville Hancock and Rochester pays for your recycling, and and Able charges for the trash, and that funds um, the other part of us to be there, and the disposal and all that. So what my proposal is is I would like to take, in lack of a better word, make all three towns a tri-town agreement with you guys, but you would be the host town. So we would pull into your parking lot where we do now. We would pull there 52 weeks a year from 8 in the morning to 11. You would pay no more money than you pay now. Granville and Hancock would pay the same as they pay, but they would be allowed, they would have to drive. So the benefit for you guys, it's really simple, um, by allowing, by you being the host town and allowing the two other towns to come there, you get a three-hour program 52 weeks a year for the same money opposed to a, a three-hour program 24 times a year. The Granville and Hancock would get a benefit. They have a two-hour program each one of them do. One is the morning and one is 11 to 1. They would go to a three-hour program. They would go 52 weeks, not 24, um, and they would be much more consistent. But their drawback is they would have to drive to Rochester. So before I go to Granville and Hancock, the first, the first start is to have your guys' approval. If you said we couldn't do that or was not willing for Granville and Hancock to come there, it, it's a new point for me to go any further. Right. I Personally, I think that sounds like a pretty good deal for us. Do um, you guys have thoughts about that? It sounds great to me. I'm, I, I don't see a downside to it as, as long as uh, Art can talk uh, the other two towns in driving. That's most Would of you have to increase the, the truck, your, your capacity at all for those weeks or would you still be just using one truck or possibly two? Well, we would still be using one truck because now we have a split load truck, 34 yards. But this is the kicker. Your program runs right now every other week and sometimes you run three weeks because on your bye week okay and that truck never never packs out and and what you're going to do is buy your businesses are your big recycle factors in rochester but instead of them coming once every two weeks they're going to come every week so they're not going to have the volume the volume of recycling or trash should not change in these programs. I, I, I don't see, they're just changing, we're just changing the times and the place and giving you more opportunity to get rid of the same amount of product. I don't know why the product would go up by being there 52 weeks a year opposed to 24 times. Yeah, it split it up a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm correct. It should even it out. It should even it out and make it much more consistent. But absolutely, the answer to the question is we would start with one truck. If we if we had a desire to have two, we would. There's two people that go there because the program needs the service part of the program, taking care of the customers. We need two people there. So we have the availability to put another truck there, but, but I personally don't think that your volume, um, I hope it goes up, but, but I, don't, I don't see that happening. So Mr. Linz, the time would be the same. What would it be, nine to when? No, you are, well, Rochester is eight to 11. Eight to 11, okay, that's right. I'm sorry, excuse me, thank you. So right, time... and you're right now first and third. So right. you would be eight to 11, the only difference is you wouldn't have to worry about the first and third. You'd be there every week. Yep. Doesn't mean you have to come every week. Yep. Eight to eleven a.m. every Saturday morning. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I think you have our our encouragement to go forward and, and present this to the Hancock and Granville. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. You're That's all. And I will um, keep you. I will schedule another meeting once I, I go to theirs. And if we can put it together, hopefully we can. Um, we'll just write a simple addendum to your um, contract. Like I said, your, your price will not change. Yep. So it's, it's just the structure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Thank okay. Thank it. you so much. You guys have a great night. Yeah. All right. Good night. Bye bye. Um, the next item on the agenda was the old firehouse building. Is this a, a, a remnant of the past meeting? Is there um, something specific about that, Julie? Uh, no, I, I sent him an email and he said he spoke with you over the weekend. Yeah. So he, yeah, he, yeah. he's all set. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. Thank you. Um, uh, which means nothing's happening all set. Yep. No. Um, so now we've got um, a driveway permit for our, um, Aggie Klaus uh, for her property on Robinson Avenue. And I was, spoke with her earlier today about that. And um, and I guess we um, wanted to give you a little more time, Aggie, to, to nail down exactly where your property line is, just to make sure that um, we don't, you know, step on anybody's toes in that exactly yeah can you hear me i yeah oh. i hear you yeah. yeah okay sorry I've, right. I've only done zoom meetings with doctors so yeah. <laughs> i apologize um yeah um i had spoken with julie and unfortunately what i didn't know is that there was no survey for my property so um i'd asked her to look into the abutters and maybe they would have surveys so we could figure out exactly where that boundary line is. I know that what I had spoken with, I spoke to David Harvey, he came, we looked at it um, and I'm 99.9% .9 sure that it is on my property. However, I wanna be 100% sure that it is on my property. Yep. Um, I looked for pins, I could not find any. Um, so, I guess um, a friend of mine who is a realtor has offered to come with me to town hall if it would help Julie to find out it is the one boundary really that is the issue. Um, and I'm ashamed to say <laughs> I don't know who that is. I know that it's um, that it's Amy. Um, I know their daughter, but I don't know them because they don't live there. They just use it as business. Um, and I've never met them. So we need to look at that, make sure that it's within the boundaries. Yep, it should and, be um, easy to, well, relatively easy to, even if you don't have a survey, it should have a verbal description in the, in the deeds. And I, I, I would think a little research should be able to, to nail that down. I'm very much hoping so. And I would love to do it um, as soon as possible because I would love to just, you know, make this, parking issue be a non-issue <laughs> so we'll um we'll um gather more information and and maybe we can um finalize this at the next meeting that would be great david is saying he could do the work at the end of may i'd love to have that happen all right as soon as possible great thank you for coming to anyone else have any questions about that or i guess we're just waiting for more information yep all right are you, are you happy with that, Burma? You okay um, with that? Sure. I you mean, don't have the, enough you're information. The you're the one that's going to be most affected. You don't have enough information yet. Right. Right. So, so, so yeah, it's um, we're, we'll table that and gather more information. Yep. Yep. So, um, we have a park use application for Green Up Day. Um, I saw that. Um, a little announcement sign go up there so i think that's a little nudge to um I, i'd move to approve that application I'm presuming that they're gonna um you know follow the covid practicalities i can second that um yeah i talked to nick to put something in the paper and he said that um he's basically going to be there to hand out green bags and um, collect bags full of stuff from people. And he asked me to put in the article that people are, you know, to, to cover, to uh, observe COVID practices, et cetera. So hopefully um, we'll have a successful green up day. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, all in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, green up day is coming. Spring is actually coming. We've already talked about black gold compost. And so the 4th of July, it's, um, I'm kind of inclined to think that maybe we should just, just put it on hold for one more year. I know. You know, Dick, uh, excuse me, uh, Dune, I kind of agree with you. I, I heard from Becky Donay, who do deals with uh, Pierce Hall events and stuff. And she said that they're going to be doing a chicken barbecue like they did last year. And they're also hoping to be able to do the, the uh, 4th of July dash uh, race that they've done in the past. And I guess they would do a lot of, you know, I don't know whether people would wear masks or what, but she was talking about they'd have to follow COVID guidelines. Yeah. Um, I talked about this with Patty Harvey this morning. Um, I, um, I don't want to disappoint people because I know people enjoy the parade and everything, but it seems like um, I heard from the governor's office finally. Um, and um, while his, his wording was that he was allowing, um, he wasn't going to have any restrictions on, on the amount of people to be at a gathering after July 4th, but he was, um, um, what would you call it? Um, having all kinds of ideas. Well, I, I'm losing the word that I meant, but it was precautions, that's it. Precaution. He was asking yeah. precautions. Um, people to take all all COVID precautions, and it, 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 from what I've been seeing on the news and online, it seems like so many places once they open up things a lot, they get another rash of of, of COVID. Now, um, certain activities like the the park concerts that we're having on Sunday nights and stuff, people that's a whole different ball game. People can separate each from each other, you know, and do it that way. Whereas our parade, we always seem to get just a big crowd and it's very yeah. hard to get people, up, to keep people further, uh, far enough apart. And I don't know, I don't, I don't, I feel uncomfortable about this still. It seems I, like I, we're still- I, uh, I mean, we've made it this far. I think that we could, um, we could celebrate in a quieter way one more year. You know. I mean, I don't know how anyone else feels about it and I don't want to disappoint people, like I said, but I just kind of feel that way too. And there would be the um, Pierce Hall event, you know, with the barbecue and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. Well, what does everyone else think? Um, Vic, think, do you want to comment? Yeah, I think we should remember the pandemic is still here and yeah. we'll be here through the summer and beyond. And secondly, that children under the age of, what it is, 12, 13, will not have any vaccination available until probably next winter at the earliest. So they are vulnerable. I mean, they're, they're relatively protected in the school setting because it's a very well-managed, controlled environment. But kids running around in groups or mixing with adults in, uh, in a uh, parade setting is a different animal. Um, yeah. So I have concerns about it. I spoke with uh, Monica Boyd, who's the vice president at Gifford, who manages their vaccination and, and uh, testing program. And she is also concerned about that kind of setting. Um, uh, the governor's guidance right now is, you know, uh, you can gather after the 4th of July, but masks and distancing are still strongly recommended, though not required anymore as of that point. And, you know, assuming that the vaccination rate continues on track. So if, if it's any comfort to saying maybe not this year, I would just say that uh, I, I would second that. Thank you very much. I feel better to hear people say that because I was feeling like I was um, because I've been the organizer. Yeah, it's for okay, Martha. You're not letting this down. You're just. Well, being I don't. I don't want to disappoint people, but on the other hand, okay. I was worried about it, and I talked. Like I said, I talked it over with Patty, and I got the feeling that Patty agreed with me. So, yeah. okay. Thank okay. you very much, so, guys. So I guess that's it. We'll, we'll um, skip the the big Fourth of July. Um, Jeff, Jeff Hart, you're muted. You're you're. Still muted. I'm muted. <laughs> there you go. Had to do that at least once a day, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, I have the uh, GMP Resiliency Zone Community Profile. Julie and I have answered everything I think that we are capable of answering. Um, you just approved the LIMP um, policy, so uh, that's good. It's needed in here. Who should I work with uh, to get the rest of the answers on this uh, front and back two-page form? 
Pat's volunteering up there. Okay. <laughs> I'll reach out uh, offline to help pick a time. Okay. Or just send, I'll send you this and, and frankly, that's probably the easiest thing. I don't think there's any more I can really add to it. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's get the park parade. So we have the only other things were the um, additions that were made to the agenda through an email with some questions about what's happening with the signage on Bethel Mountain Road. Um, Frank, you had a little update on that, right? Uh, I basically have been in touch with uh, several people on the state level. Uh, I'm still trying to get permission to get some signage on Route 100 and at the junction 173 indicating alternative routes uh, instead of GPS and the mountain road. And I'm working with Bethel. Uh, Therese is on vacation this week. I did talk with Chris Bump last week and he, he thinks that what we're trying to do is a good approach. Um, at least you're not gonna stop the traffic. So it's just impossible to do that. But, but maybe some added signage indicating where 89 is from here might be useful and also indicating coming off from 89 going west and north um, would you know with signs indicating what routes to take and also on route 12 before you get onto the Camp Brook Road. Um, so we're trying to work on it that way and I think that will help some. And, and, and we've been working in communication with folks in Bethel who are feeling the, the same right. way, correct? Yes, I've, I've been in touch with Therese, the town manager there, and uh, <clears throat> um, she's on vacation this week. So, and last week, part, part week, she was gone too. So, um, I haven't really talked to her this, but I will keep going on it and keep working on it. And Chris is helping and as far as getting in touch with his superiors more. And, and he said if he doesn't get anywhere, he's going to let me go at him that way. So, I, I will keep on it. I, I'll make phone calls at least once a week just to try to get some movement on it. No, thank you. So, yeah. I have some comments regarding the road signage, June. Um, uh, yeah, is this Robert? This is Robert. Yep. I just want everyone uh, present in the meeting tonight to know that the signage that was placed on uh, Bethel Mountain Road and Middle Hollow Road cost taxpayers about $45,000. That's about $1,500 per message. And I talked to uh, Chris about it, his supervisor and VTRANS, and uh, basically they had no clue about what was really needed, but they knew they spent 40, I think it was $42,800 $42, for what doesn't direct anyone to anywhere. It, it, it was helpful. It was a good start. But I contacted Chris, and um, basically he shook his hands and said, hey, good luck. So, um, yeah. so um, it, it, the, um, the um, what are you saying about that? That's, um, we're, we're talking about increased signage to try and um, direct trucks before they turn on to Bethel Mountain Road. But that's... Um, well, I think that'd be money well, it's not. It, it, it's not just the trucks turning onto Bethel Mountain Road, whether it be on Rochester side or the Bethel side. It is the um, uh, Flatlanders, pardon the expression, that can when they come into Rochester, they have no clue where to go. There's not one, two. Like I travel five, six hundred miles a week for North Hollow, and there's always signs in towns to say where to get onto the major highway. Yep. When you so, get into Rochester, you're basically lost. Well, that's what there, we're talking no, about changing. That's what we're talking about changing. Well, what what I'm what I need to suggest to you is that the um, the project that cost us forty five thousand dollars took about five years to be executed, and it was executed incorrectly. The advice I can give to Frank and to Chris and to Therese uh, is that they need local input to understand what is really needed, not VTrans corporate or VTrans, yep. uh, you so know. So that's, 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 that's what's happening right now. 
So we're we're no, you're 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 assuming that's what's what's happening, but it no, needs to have. Hear, Frank just said he's gonna he's calling them every week, and that's about as local as you get. Frank, grew well, up no, what what uh, doing? What I'm suggesting is ask um, local people in Rochester and Bethel and along this road. I'm in the middle of it. I have tractor trailers coming into my door yard that have to back up three miles to get out of here. Yeah. I've got people coming in um, uh, at, at 11 o'clock at night in the winter trying to get to Sugarbush, and I end up in, uh, I'm disgraced because they, they're using their GPS, and I'm just saying, I'm so sorry, your GPS is wrong. So I've been through this for, for four years. Yep. So, so it, it's um, not. It, I, I, we, yeah, we, we know it's been. This is not the first time this this um issue has come come before us, and and what we're reporting on is is, you know, the current attempts to to move forward on that and to to um and I think that having, like you mentioned, signs directing you to the interstate, not pointing up Bethel Mountain Road, it would be a a, a good practical step in the right direction that's what we're well i i pushed i i talked to chris chris about that and you know you know maybe there maybe people in the town of rochester don't want like signage on the park but um you need to we're talking about signage on route 100 before you even turn on the park yeah well I, um, I'm just robert, saying. robert um i saw nancy had a comment she wanted to make i want to spread this out and get more more input. Uh, what were you going to say, Nancy? I was just going to say I came over the mountain tonight and talking about signage. As you come down to the the T uh, with Metal, Middle Hollow, there looks like someone knocked over one of those signs. Yeah. Yeah, Nancy, you're right. That that sign was taken out. It's bent over and done. Well, I just want to su suggest to everyone: when I pull out a Hooper Hollow Road, it is a death trap. People are coming over the mountain right at the end of my road at 70 miles an hour. So my little Subaru or the Volvo, it, 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 and then a tractor trailer comes over or a, 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 a tour bus. Robert White and I have helped more people crashing into trees that the paper never knew about. And I'm just saying it needs the cooperation of both towns. And I know you're, uh, Frank's working on that with Therese. Yeah, but you know, it, it, it someone is going, either a family or a a, a seventeen year old person is going to be no, sadly. People, yeah, people have died on that on that road before. Yeah. Well, we have a major right moose town. crossing. Right in town. There's a major moose crossing on the flats when you uh, uh, go above Hooper Hollow Road towards Rochester. Well, they they didn't sign that. You know, so all I'm requesting is that rather than deal, take take uh, information from the local people that know the road, like Nancy Woolley, like like uh, Martha that drive it every day, before you even yep. go to V Trans. And by the way, the reason why we don't have any towing companies of AAA people in this valley is because they got so sick and tired of a $90,000 Audi stuck on a, 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 a snow machine trail. They just said, we don't want it. We don't want it. Yep. Pat, yep. were you raising During... your hand about something? Okay. Uh, Howard Doyle now has a tow truck. I was just saying. I know. That... We 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 spent a good five minutes on this. So could we we we, we could move on to the next item or yes yeah yeah know. we're not so um, Robert you also requested some clarification about Two Rivers Ottaquichi. Uh, I'm not exactly clear about what your your question. You didn't understand how they get their funding or or what is what is your question about Two Rivers. Well, I, I was denied to put my um, um, questions onto the agenda, and now you're asking the questions that I placed. I was denied um, having them warned. 
Um, no, so, they were no. I actually placed them on here. They're they were too late to be on the printed agenda. But at the beginning of each meeting, we ask if anyone has any amendments, and so that's where I added what you had um, put on to the. Um, I don't think you quite understood that. I thought that Pat had. Well, I think you should go to back to the Orca or Orca recordings when you asked, would you like, would anyone like to add anything to the agenda? So that's what I. Uh, that's, so now that's been changed. Well, well, so that 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 happened. I did that for you because you didn't make it to the meeting at six o'clock, and you had communicated your desire to add those. Now there are not things that we can make specific decisions, but we can talk about them. So what was your question about two rivers? I have a major question with regards to the uh, where the money comes uh, from to two rivers when the town tax base can't afford improvements, whether it be in Rochester or Bethel, uh, Hooper Hollow Road no. was just upgraded. So the, the, um, the town could- Can I answer your question? Well, you already did. I was just trying to answer oh. the, the question. Would you, would you like me to finish? Yes. Okay, so uh, for 16 years, I, we survived up here at Hooper Hollow, and thanks to Therese and uh, Two Rivers, we got grants to upgrade Hooper Hollow Road, and they did a great, they did a good job. Let's just say that. But the money ran out. They never finished the project. So, so I, um, I, I, what I'm trying to get, what I'm trying to ask everyone present tonight, including you, Dune, is where if the tax base cannot afford. Uh, the support and infrastructure of a town. Where does the money what? Where does the money come from to uh, feed torque to then be given to towns? Okay, I don't so understand where that. Where that where that comes from is they are um, a quite a, a helpful ally in applying for grants and helping the town execute the, the contortions we need to go to at, to access money from the state and from the federal government. And out of those projects is written into, is written in their cut. So it's basically, they, um, just like any grant writer, they get a, a proportion, you know, a percentage of the monies um, generated by, by their work. So the, the bulk of the money goes to the project and they get a cut for their um, their making it happen. It's just like when you wash windows, you know, you um, whether it's a private person or it's a, a a business, you know, you give them a bill and they and they pay it. But so, no, Dune, yeah. you, you didn't answer the question. The question is, where does the money? Where you're you're saying that uh, Two Rivers out of Quichi gets federal and state funding? Is they, that they, what you're they're, saying? They're grant writers, basically. Very. I, no, I'm not asking writers. if. Yeah, and that's they how could they be go. Their, that's how they get the bulk of their money. You know, but I where does the money come? What? Wait a second. They're grant writers, like ghost writers. Where do they get? Where does Two River Atacuichi get the money to finance what we can't afford? They write grants. I guess I don't quite understand your question, Robert. I mean, it's they they get the money from the projects that they create, different sources. They get it from funders, from funders, and those funders yeah. can be government funds or private funds. They know where the funds are. They help towns locate and identify the funds, and then they help the towns apply for the funds, and they get a cut. Yeah. And it's federal cut. and state funds, right? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not I'm not this I'm not discounting anyone that supports uh, and funds uh, Two River out of Quichi. Those persons that are funding them, that should be <coughs> public information. It is. It is. I mean, it's um, it's not there's nothing hidden about it. It's um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what your what your um, confusion is about that. Um, but the um this is not the place to keep going so um you had another question about um the redistricting redistrict 
redistricting how do you pronounce redistricting. it redistricting Districting. yeah what's 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 the story there robert what are you what are you talking about well, according to the uh, 220 census, uh, Rochester is, uh, if you look at the geo geographic and political map of, of the Windsor County or the Rutland-Windsor County Voting District, uh, Rochester is uh, is like the red-haired red stepchild. So there's a number of people that really want to annex Rochester to Addison, Chittenden, or um, Orange County. Which I think is very logical. Uh, that's first I've heard of this. I don't. I haven't heard anything about that. Yeah. <coughs> well, I'm just I'm just saying that that if everyone present tonight goes on to the um, senators' maps and whatever, and look at Rochester, it's in the middle of nowhere. Okay. And Windsor County, the 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 county of Windsor including Rochester, is so gigantic that um, I don't think the senators and the represented and voted uh, politicians, they, they, they can't handle it. It's like Chittenden County up in Burlington. It's uh, way too big. So this is, um, and, and what are you asking us to do about that? Well, I think everyone... Um, the select board and people and residents of Rochester should look at it and look at it logically and um, and understand um, uh, you know the, the 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 political dynamics of it. And the two the two twenty uh, census will you know basically um, pr pretty much demand how Rochester is placed within voting districts and counties. Well, that's not really something that we have control of here in in um in our town. So it's an interesting um, interesting thought. I'd be curious to see how that plays out. So first, I yeah. heard of heard of the thought of them re um, structuring the counties. Pat, you have some input on that. The last time this was done and was in 2012. Um, I don't believe that we were affected at that time. Um, but uh, it, it took a couple of years after the 2010 Celsius census to um, do the redistricting. So I think this is an ongoing thing. And especially with COVID, it might be another couple of years before it's resolved. Um, if there are people, Robert, that you feel are concerned, voters in Rochester, that you feel are concerned about that, then please have them uh, get in contact with uh, their representatives. Right. Well, it's it's not it's not a. It, I'm just I'm just announcing this information. And by the way, it's mostly people from Pittsfield, Stockbridge, Bethel, uh, that are uh, uh, looking into the redistricting okay. of Rochester. Okay. Good. It, it's just a. It's kind of like a wake up call, because okay. Rochester could end up in one of the other counties. And it's all due to the uh, political dynamics of uh, the 220 census. Okay. And yes, it, your Dune is correct. It will take uh, just like the signage, the new signage proposed. You know, it, it'll take probably three to four years. Okay, so noted. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think the last thing that you had questions about is your. Wondering why the select board is still meeting via Zoom while businesses are open? Uh, yep, that was on the agenda. On your or, agenda? No, not on the agenda, but on trying to be agenda. put on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. So basically we're following the, the um, guidelines from the state government and just like we, um, use those as part of our reasoning to not have the 4th of July parade this year. Um, we're still um, not out of the woods in the, the COVID situation. And um, we're, until we're directed otherwise, I think they were gonna continue conducting the town business as safely as possible. So you you your business as a bike uh, retailer is essential. Is that correct? 
a lot of people think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Patty's hardware store is essential, and I, I understood her email with regards to feeding uh, animals and keeping people warm. But I think it's time that towns, including Rochester, should talk to the uh, governor and say, you know what, we, we can have a socially distanced select board meeting with, without having to run and get codes and passwords. Just let's go back to socially distanced. Why in God's world can everyone shop at Max, shop at the hardware, shop at the bike shop, and not go into the into the town clerk's office socially distanced in a proper way and not be on a telephone or a computer. Robert. Yep. Robert. Can you hear me? I'm here. Um, the buildings have are only allowed 50% capacity. And so what's 50 what's 50%? 5 Five people. So why can't we why can't we have a uh, an outdoor select board meeting on the parking lot? Robert, this it's I'm um, a parade. <laughs> we're not going to have a parade. Um, I personally uh, we, we, we have we have out, we have outdoor church meetings. We, we have had more people showing up on Zoom select board meetings than we regularly did in in person select board meetings. In in except for cases when there was a big um, big kerfluffle and, and some really big issue, and in which case we also have multiple screens of people showing up on Zoom. Um, Dune, just I, I mean, I attend every meeting because I cover them for the Herald, but I'm also a registered voter. I, I truly appreciate the fact that you have continued to do the meetings via Zoom because I now that I have lymphedema and I can't walk without a walker, it's much easier for me to be at home to do to to be the meeting. And I believe you're absolutely right. It seems like there are. I've been covering the meetings for years. It seems like there are more people attending the meetings this way at this point, you know, in time. Um, and because it's maybe easier for them, I don't know. Um, but I appreciate you continuing to do it and we'll, and we'll be glad to continue to do it. I would also like to add that I appreciate having a Zoom meeting. I don't drive at night. I don't drive at dusk. And I wouldn't go out to... A select board meeting under those conditions. And so I also find it very um, convenient and effective. Thank you. You know, we may find who, that. Who, who was, be, who, 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 can once, I interrupt? Who was just speaking? Uh, my name is Burma Cassidy. Hey, Burma. Hey. So, um, what I was just about to say is we may find that once we do resume physical meetings, we may keep a Zoom component specifically for people that can't make it to the meeting or people that are, you know, um, property owners that are out of town and, and, you know, have something important to say. They Dune haven't built their house yet, you know. Dune, does that, would that cost extra for you for you to do that? I don't know anything about this. I'm not the technological person. It wouldn't cost any more than it's costing us now to do it. Oh, well, then I would be thrilled to death if you were continued to do that at some point, you know. Well, that's just well, well Dune, Martha, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, Dune, I think the compromise, and I totally understand and have compassion for those that cannot get to a meeting, whether it be, you know, driving or whatever. I totally get that, but there should be a compromise. And if Martha wants to not get into the town clerk's office, I think that is fine. If if, but I think the in-person meeting is really important. So maybe we can do a 50-50, like anyone that wants to join us via Zoom, let's roll. Anyone that wants to come in public, let's accommodate them. But th this is getting well, kind of painful. What if more than five people showed up at the town office for a select board meeting? And right, we have five already with the three of us in Julie. And if we ever, that, that leaves room for one person, you know? <laughs> so it's really it Robert we're going to we're going to just follow along and and run the course with um you know the directives that were given by the governor and um and and um you know that's that's where we're at right well, now 
Well, I think uh, we've worn that conversation out. But uh, lastly, I, I, I've requested from Julie the uh, Board of Civil Authority minutes from 2004 to 2020. Those are all on uh, the website. The I'm and sure not, not, not going back to 2004. Oh, not to 2004? Uh, no. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why they hadn't been put on there. I'm not finding them myself. Well, Julie, the last time I uh, um, visited the town clerk's office requesting the uh, Board of Civil Authority minutes after the 218 election, um, Nancy Woolley was there, and we, we couldn't find them. We couldn't find anything. So you're saying you, it doesn't go back to 2004, but... It, they do it, in a book. Well, I, I don't understand why when I requested the book in the town clerk's office, uh, uh, you couldn't find them. There was no book. No, I gave you the. I gave you the book. You went through. No, it. you did not. No, 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 you did not because I was looking for very specific things regarding election days and the board of civil authorities' involvement. Nancy Woolley witnessed it. Robert, they were nowhere to be found. Robert, it can it can be taken care of. It, it can be taken care of? What, what does that mean? I believe you probably can go visit Julie again. She'll provide you with the material that you're looking for that she has already provided you with. Nancy, yes. I've never been provided with any Board of Civil Authority minutes in the town clerk's office of Rochester. She never provided uh, anything. Are, are we done? Uh, I think that I think that um, that's um, I think that we're done, Robert. If you need help finding deeper minutes, I'm sure that Julie can hand you the books that you can carouse. But they're not they're not on the website. I didn't realize how. Soon, I guess. When did we start putting stuff on the website? I guess I don't after think that. We even had a website in 2004. Right, right. So that's like, so. Um, so they're there. It just um, takes some, um, some digging, Robert. So I'm requesting the, the select board and the town clerk to provide me the board of civil authority minutes from 2004, whether they're digital or printed or copied. Um, I I don't have the time to sit in the town clerk's office looking for these things. Oh, good. Well, and Dude. we do, huh? Yeah. Um, but that is the. Well, the no. What? what uh, um, wait a minute, uh, uh, Robert. Uh, uh, if you're you're asking, there's the minutes are there. If you want to research them, but you're saying you don't have the time to sit there and do the research. Um, you know, you're asking people to look for things that's in that you know is in your head. It's um, you know, you gotta you gotta be willing to put the work in if you if if you want to do that, Robert. I think any any information that any casual observer or pedestrian wants from a town clerk's office, the town clerk should be able to provide them in a very proper and timely way. And they weren't were not. Well, so I'm I'm just asking guidance, as I said to you in my email and Frank and Patty, I'm asking for guidance on how to find the Board of Civil Authority minutes from 2004 to 2020. It's not my responsibility. They should be recorded and very, very properly uh, secured. So Julie, you you know where the book is that would have the minutes that Robert is looking for? Yes, I do. Yep. Okay. There you go, Robert. Um, you know. So Julie has the minutes of the Board of Civil Authority of Rochester back to 2004. Is that a fact? I I have a book. I haven't read through them, so I don't know exactly what is in there, but I can I can look at it. Okay. Well, maybe over the next week. I'll give you a call, and if you find some Board of Civil Authority minutes in 2004, I'd be happy to read them. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's it, unless anyone else has something they want to talk about tonight. 
Nope. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thank, thank you, Frank, you. and, and Good night, Patty. Everybody. Thanks, Good night, everybody. everybody. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.